it's a little yeah. Hey everybody, welcome to tonight's city council meeting. At this time, I'll call the meeting to order. Um, I think I'll take the Pledge of Allegiance. No, thank you. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Do I hear adoption of the agenda? So moved. Second. Second. Move and second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Pass unanimously. Thank you. Okay, at this time, I'm going to read a proclamation on uh, on the Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Bear with me. My voice is like it's been the last month. Sexual assault is a pervasive, every, it's pervasive. Every 68 seconds, someone is sexually assaulted in the United States. And whereas Black, Indigenous, and other people of color, people living in poverty, LGBTQ, and people LGBTQ people, elders, people with disabilities, and others who have been historically oppressed are disproportionately affected by sexual violence in significant and complex ways. And whereas sexual assault is among the most underreported crimes for many reasons, but survivors who are already most marginalized face additional barriers to reporting, such as language, immigration status, or disability. And whereas ending sexual violence requires us to address racism, sexism, and all forms of oppression that contribute to per perpetuate of sexual assaults. And whereas sexual violence exists on a continuum of behavior that includes racist, sexist, transphobic, homophobic, atheist, atheist, or other hate speech, this ranges from rape jokes to verbal harassment to physical assault. And whereas by working together as a community, we can alleviate the trauma of sexual violence by ensuring supportive resources are by ensuring supportive resources are available to all survivors while standing up to uh, the actively disruptive harmful attitudes and behaviors that contribute to sexual violence. Though therefore the mayor, the mayor and the city council of Lake Forest Park do hereby pro proclaim April 23rd as Sexual Assault Awareness Month in the city of Lake Forest Park, enjoying advocates and communities throughout King County in taking action to prevent sexual violence by standing with survivors together. We commit to a safer future for all children, young people, adults, and families in our community. Signed this 23rd day of March, 2023. Um, I've read this uh, nine, eight, this is my eighth time in a row and that's a brand new one. Sorry about that. I hadn't. I didn't think I need to practice on. I hadn't read that one, so sorry about that. Um, for that, we will go on to uh, final confirmation. Steve, would you like to introduce our our candidate? I already warned him that you guys are going to be tough on him. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, Sam Castic has uh, lived in the city for seven years now, and he is an uh, attorney by trade and. Um, as you'll see from his uh, application, has a lot of experience um, working on uh, boards and committees, and uh, he's attended a planning commission meeting and uh, apparently still wants to be a planning commissioner. So with that, I'd like to him the opportunity to come up and answer your questions. Hi, everyone. I'm Sam. Pleased to be here tonight. Happy to help with any questions or give an intro or whatever would be most helpful. Uh, go ahead and do an intro. Intro. Terrific. So as Steve was saying, I've lived here for seven years with my husband. Love living in Lake Forest Park. We live in an old historic home uh, just north of the elementary school on Ballinger. Uh, work from home a couple days a week, commute into the city a couple days a week. I practice as a data privacy and cybersecurity attorney. Uh, love living in Lake Forest Park. I love the... Uh, physical landscape. Uh, it's one of the things that drew us to the community as well as the, the people in the neighborhood. So love the trees, love the aesthetic, but also conscious of the fact that we need to balance uh, access to affordable housing with increased density, access to services and preservation of our natural environment. So I'm thrilled to uh, be nominated for the Planning Commission and eager to help on the challenge of redoing the comprehensive master plan. I know it'll be a lot of work, but 
eager to get involved and follow along. Great. Council, do we have any questions? Yes, Council Member Bodie. Welcome, Sam, and uh, thank you for coming to the last Planning Commission meeting to see what you are getting, what you might be getting into. Um, uh, I have a question for you. One of the interesting things about serving on our um, on our commissions and boards, especially when there's a pro public process about to go forward, is you're wearing a hat representing the community in the Planning Commission, and then you're reaching out to the community as a point of contact uh, for the planning commission and, and the city. So can you can you comment on those uh, two hats th that you'll be wearing as a planning commissioner? Absolutely. So of course you bring a perspective as a resident of the, of the community when you're on the commission, but I think a key part of the comprehensive plan update is the plan to really do some outreach and have a number of town halls and have a number of other ways for people to engage. It's not everybody can come to a town hall. I think it's really important to get the sense of where people are at in terms of the needs and the challenges facing our community and take that into account when validating does the old comprehensive master plan and the statement of values still reflect our community's values or have they evolved? Because we've all evolved as a society uh, in that time. There's been a lot that's changed since then. So I think the role of the commissioners is really to make sure the process really is cultivated to get input from all of the community members in a way that's appropriate and in a way that's accessible for where they all are at, uh, whether that's you know through online submissions, physical town halls, virtual town halls, and targeted outreach. Uh, but I think it's really important that we take that all into account and not over-index on the views of the people that happen to be sitting on the commission at any particular time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, Council Member for a time. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and thank you, Mr. Kastik, for volunteering. It's really great to see members of our community stepping up. Um, we have a lot of different commissions, like the Climate Action and Tree Board and things like that. What particularly attracted you to the Planning Commission? Yeah, it's interesting to me. I, I, I'm interested in zoning. I'm interested in how we uh, have zoning so that it provides opportunities for small and local businesses uh, from our community and that people in our community may want to have, but also uh, that balances the competing challenges we have with access to housing, increased density, needs to balance uh, what the state is gonna be mandating through all the legislation that it's considering and passing uh, and doing that in a way that preserves the character uh, and the unique characteristics of our community. That for me has been an interest and a passion more recently. Uh, and even going back to when I was in high school and I was first appointed uh, to my town's environmental commission and we passed one of Illinois' first uh, municipal tree ordinances in the state after Mr. T brought his property, took a chainsaw, cut all the trees down on his property, <laughs> hundreds of historic trees. Uh, there was kind of a movement in, in Illinois rather to passed some tree ordinances. And in the town that I grew up in, we had a lot of historic and landmark trees. So that was really a top concern. So it's always been an interest of mine, uh, that physical landscape, the community that you live in, making it sustainable, but also making it so it evolves uh, in light of the values and challenges. So that's why I applied to be on the Planning Commission specifically. Well, thank you. Yes. Uh, Deputy Mayor French. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, Sam, thank you so much for your willingness to serve. And I would be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to my friend, friend Mike Hinsey, who uh, uh, right there, if you're working with his firm, you have my recommendation as well. Um, he's a great friend uh, from Shorecrest in the past, and I uh, really appreciate your willingness to volunteer. You mentioned the, the balance of um, uh, of the state and the local kind of you know, uh, uh, characteristics. Could you expand on that a little bit more, please? Yeah. So do you mean specifically with respect to the legislation? Exactly. And it's pending right now, if you're aware of what's going. Yeah. And from the bits and pieces that I've followed, including the briefings that have happened at the past uh, three commission meetings, I've watched the, the past two virtually and attended the last one in person. Um, the bits and pieces I've caught there and from looking at the first bill that passed and reading some of the news articles, maybe it's a moot point. I mean, maybe the commission's recommendations really won't be relevant at all because the state legislation is really looking at taking away local control of 
issues like density and like, you know, what uh, type of zoning you need to allow. Certainly if we're in, you know, so many uh, miles of mass transit, which of course we'll have along uh, Bothell Way and potentially along Ballinger Way, as we heard at the last meeting. Uh, so it's a challenge because I think a lot of the local control from this body and from, you know, the commission making recommendations to this body may be taken away. But if it's not, and if there's room to interpret um, or to apply some flexibility with local values, I think, you know, there'll be an opportunity for the commission really to step up with the consultants, with the staff at the planning department, and really do some careful thought, some thinking uh, and soul searching with the community to feel what the values are, and then to tailor appropriately the recommendations within the confines of the law for the council to consider uh, in updates, both to the comprehensive master plan, but probably also to the zoning code, because that's going to be required by some of these state laws. Very thank well. You. Thank you very much for your answer. Of course. Council Member Riddle. Thank you. Uh, so, Sam, I really appreciate you uh, stepping up to serve for, for this community. Obviously, you've managed to serve in other communities, and, and you know kind of what you're getting yourself into as someone who started on Planning Commission when it was going into one of its first reviews of the comp plan. Um, thank you. Uh, <laughs> it's a busy time, and it's a very important effort, um, and I appreciate you stepping up at this critical time in uh, in our community's future. Um, so thank you for your, your time. That's all I want to say. Well, thank you. You're looking forward to some fun up ahead. Anybody else? Yes. Councilmember Cass over here. Thank you very much. Um, and Sam, I am, you know, just like, wow, thank you. <laughs> uh, your understanding of what we face is is really uh, very heartening to hear that you've done your homework, that you've attended some commission meetings, that you're following what's happening at the state. And um, one of the things that's on my mind as we look at what the state does is what happens at the town center. Mm. So um, I hope you... Um, will take a, a bit of a look at the sub area plan that we worked on so hard uh, a year or so ago. Was it just a year? No, two years ago. Now. Yeah, it's just, oh, yeah. It's, how time flies. It, it sure does. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> because, you know, that really is the heart of our community and it's going to be very important to understand how we manage um, to interact with whatever the state legislation is and the owners of the mall. And we, we as a council will re really look forward to working closely with the, with the uh, planning commission. So I'm just here to say that I, you have my hearty uh, support and um, thank you so much for uh, offering for free to spend some of your valuable time. <laughs> Why did you ask that? I thought there was remuneration. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> I think that's the first time I've ever said I've heard that. <laughs> By the way, we're not paying you for this. Uh, it's really public service, and we appreciate it very much. Thank you. Anybody else? With that, Mr. Mayor, if I if my colleagues don't uh, have additional questions, I'd like to uh, move the full term appointment of Sam Castic to our planning commission. Second, oh, second. Oh, you beat me to it. It's, it's been moved in second. Any other discussion? All those in favor of Sam joining our planning commission, please say aye. 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 Any nays? Pass unanimously. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Thank you, Sam. Sam. Welcome. Thank you. You know, this is a word the mayor hardly has ever used. You all know me, but I'm actually giddy right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have had such great people and sam and you know i interviewed two more i am actually if it works out with you guys i do have my first bullpen we do have enough people right now that i can put in some alternates and and um, i'm really really pleased with i'm just really happy that we're getting exactly what i envisioned of having different people and different things and um way to go thank you and thank you sam um, that's the best part of my job is getting to meet these people first time. And they're like, holy cow, where'd you come from? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody I've interviewed yesterday, though, actually, I remembered that we remembered that we were in Y Guides together, which must have been not in kids, but our kids were Y Guides. But oh, yeah. it's pretty awesome. So thank you again, Sam. Um, sometime we have more time. I admire his husband, too, because he teaches at a high school. And I don't know how anybody can do that. <laughs> <laughs> We've all had teenagers and just think we've had hundreds of them. 
that would be a tough thing. So thank you both very much. With that, folks, I guess we will move on to, uh, we have the presentation from the tree board. Richard, welcome. Another one of our fine commission and commissioners. Uh, thank you. And I'm happy to be here to give a brief uh, report for the tree board for 2022 and introduce the work plan for the coming year. I uh, gave a PowerPoint to somebody that I'm yeah. hopeful we can put on the screen. Yeah. Tonight we have a green screen, actually, if you noticed. It. That was it. But let's see. There you go. Do I have control to move it or do I have to ask for it? Okay, great. Um, well, this I just want to briefly uh, highlight some of the things that we've accomplished in the last year and talk about what we have uh, uh, prioritized for the coming year. Okay, here we go. Um, the, I, don't know, I went too far. Well, let's go back one if I can. Okay, so this font is small, it's hard to see, but this is a list of tree board members who served during the year 2022. Uh, we had two who rotated off, uh, Bryn and Margaret Cassidy, Bryn Hamzi and Margaret Cassidy. Um, one other, uh, Julia Bent, who has uh, just rotated off at the end of February. We are now down to five board members. We really need two more. We've been trying to beat the bushes, but if anybody here knows someone who might like to serve on the tree board, uh, we'd love to have more members. We need more members. Um, I wanna acknowledge the planning staff and council liaison who have worked with us. Um, the list is long for this past year because there's been a significant turnover, as you all know. And our assistant planner at the beginning of the term of the year was Cameron Tuck, replaced now by Riley Bushnell. Um, our arborist at the beginning of the year was uh, Ashley Adams, and she was replaced by Harvey Harrison, and now um, Hannah, what was the last name? I thank you. Yes, thank you. So, uh, and the same with this <laughs> council liaison, Mark Phillips uh, rotated off the council early in the year last year, and Larry Goldman is now our council liaison. All of these people have been great to work with, but some of the turnover has, I think, uh, inhibited some of the things that we wanted to get done during the, the year. Um, here's just some bullet points for some of the accomplishments of the year. I'll admit, uh, elaborate on a little bit of them. Um, we made some recommendations to the tree code actually that was developed over the last couple of years, but many of them were adopted uh, by the council in 2022. Uh, a couple were put on hold uh, that relate particularly to the second point, the tree inventory. Um, the, Tree Board participated in the interview of the consulting firm to conduct the, the um, inventory. The watershed company is in progress on that. And we look forward to seeing the results of that so that we can follow up with some remaining uh, recommendations for uh, amendments to the tree code. Uh, Sandy LeVar, one of the new members of the board, has really taken over the public outreach and developed a uh, a monthly calendar that we're just now starting to implement that will help us with uh, the education and outreach um, uh, responsibility of the tree board. Um, tree planning and maintenance events, one of the big things under this heading is the wrapping up of the big Macalear Creek uh, invasive plant removal and planting of native plants. Julia Bent took the lead on that. That was supported by a $45,000 grant. Uh, from King County Waterworks. Um, there is a little bit remaining on that, that the consultants who worked on that will be doing some follow-up plantings this spring and that will be uh, done. Um, oops. We've continued to put occasional columns in the Lake Forest Park e-news to help educate uh, the public around tree trees and uh, the tree, board, tree ordinance. And we're working with uh, the um, foundation, the Stewardship Foundation to revise the uh, tree walks of Lake Forest Park, which was produced first about 15 years ago. Many of you are familiar with a little booklet that was just a text in black and white. We're now pre uh, illustrating it with color photographs, making it available through the city website to be downloaded to your handheld device or something 
with photos. So when you walk around the sit the route, you can actually say, oh yeah, that's the tree they're referring to. <laughs> so we've done two of them. We have another one planned for this spring to uh, revise. So that's mostly the, uh, the highlights of the accomplishments we've uh, taken last year. Do we, you wanna ask any questions about this or shall I move on to the work plan? Why you work on do the work plan, then we'll ask you okay. questions. Yeah. Okay, so the work plan, uh, which uh, was, I hope, distributed to you guys in the past, and I just want to uh, highlight a few things that are our priorities, although I can't read that up there, so I'm going to bring a copy with me. But uh, the things that are highlighted in yellow um, are the things that we will be taking up. Um, uh, we want to uh, do more uh, outreach to homeowners around uh, education about the, the ordinance. And that's something that uh, I mentioned, Sandy LaVar uh, is really interested in the outreach aspect, and she's going to be uh, taking some of that. We have an Arbor Day activity planned for this year. The one last year kept getting postponed and postponed. There was a variety of reasons for that and ended up not happening, but we're set to go with that. That will be on Saturday, April 19th, I believe. The Arbor Day itself is on the previous Wednesday, but we thought if it's a public event, we might have better participation on Saturday. I mentioned that we're continuing to work update the, uh, the tree walks. Uh, one of the things we wanted to look into was the old heritage tree program. I don't know if any of you know anything about this, but this was something that the city developed about 15 years ago. And it, it, they designated heritage trees that were nominated by residents. And I think the whole program has simply gone dormant. I don't think there was ever any movement to get rid of it, or, but there also has been nothing to done to enhance it. And so we want to explore whether there is something here that we should resurrect and have be a community-based um, tree program. I, if, for those of you who don't know about it, it was something where people could nominate a tree for almost any reason. It could be important landmark tree in a neighborhood. It could be a tree that is honor. Uh, there's a variety of different ways that it could be uh, a tree could be nominated and several were, and there's actually a list of them somewhere. And we're trying to find the information and data about that to see whether that's something we wanna, it may be something that should you know, uh, be left to lie, but we'll uh, <laughs> determine that. Uh, we're, as I mentioned, we're looking forward to the results of the tree inventory. This is a, a Follow up on an inventory that was done first about 10 or 12 years ago uh, and is a great body of data. And the re inventorying of those same plots will be the best way to get scientifically significant data that shows uh, over time how our tree canopy is persisting, enhanced, or di diminished. And uh, we look forward to seeing the results of that. As you may know, one of the recommendations that we had brought to the council for the ordinance was adjusting some of the minimum diameter for the trees that get maximum preservation. And the inventory will give us some idea about how many trees are there at different size categories, right? So if we have, say, we are gonna protect trees that are over 48 inches in diameter of a certain species, but there's only a handful of those trees of that size in our community, then maybe we should consider making the minimum size smaller so that we are protecting a larger number of trees. So that's one of the things that we, the inventory will be helpful. Um, one of the other things that we have uh, been pushing down the road, but hope to get to this year is going over the uh, tree list. There's a fairly extensive tree list that is a recommended trees for replacement under the ordinance when citizens remove trees, they are expected to replace trees to reestablish canopy coverage. And there, that list is dated. It doesn't have some of the information that's needed. There are a few species on that list that are considered to be invasive species that we don't think should be on the list and so on. So, and we may actually uh, recommend a second list that would be a list of trees that we urge residents to not plant uh, for that reason. 
So those are some of the highlights from our work plan going forward and for our accomplishments of the past year. I'd be happy to take any questions. Any questions? Yes. Councilmember Castover. Thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate all the work that you guys are doing. Um, one of the things that's been on my mind as I look at my own property is that with climate change, some of the trees that do well uh, now may not do so well in the future. Also, having moved here from the state of Colorado that had terrible problem with the pine beetle and uh, hoping that that doesn't come here. Um, and so I wondered if you've given some thought to climate resiliency in your updating of the tree list. Yes, that's one of the things we've talked about. And, you know, it's actually kind of a controversial issue because for many, perhaps most species, we really don't know what their environmental tolerances are. And uh, but we're definitely seeing in some of our prominent native species like big leaf maple and western red cedar apparently are suffering from the effects of climate change today. So, you know, that that will be uh, something we'll consider, I think. Although one of the other things that simply enhances resilience is, is uh, keeping diversity of trees in our neighborhood, right? Because without knowing the tolerances of most trees, if there is a diverse array of trees in our community, then we will be less likely to suffer if one very commonly planted tree, for example, uh, turns out to be more sensitive to climate change than others. Yes, Councilmember Riddle, then Councilmember Lebo. Thank you. I think in the same vein, I think there's a concern about uh, pests, invasive pests suddenly becoming uh, flourishing in this environment due to climate change. So I appreciate your interest in diversity of trees, because I think that helps make us more resilient against a, a particular pest that might target a single species. Um, and then I had a question sort of thinking about um, climate change and our policies around um, establishment and how much time we have for establishment. So I'd like to know it, it, as you're moving forward through the year, if there's a uh, better recommendations, um, you know, as we have hotter summers, uh, colder winters, if we should be rethinking our establishment plans uh, for when folks have to do a replanting to make sure that those trees actually do yeah. get established and flourish and do in fact replace the canopy that we anticipate yeah. them replacing. Yeah, you know, that's, I think, one of the issues in the code that is um, probably the most difficult thing to enforce, right? We have a replanting requirement. Uh, and I think the code even says something about that those trees are supposed to be confirmed at five years or some time interval. But the fact of the matter is the city doesn't have the staffing to be able to do all of that follow-up. So I think that's where uh, education will go a long way to helping residents who want to do the right thing um, be successful when they plant trees uh, to know that they will survive, especially those first few years, which are most critical for establishment. Thank you. That's if I may, one of the programs that I didn't highlight that, but meant to, that we are Discuss, still at the discussions phase is, and it will depend to a certain extent on how the, the funding stream from the transit program uh, is what is available for tree planning, right? Because there's going to be a lot of trees removed, as you know, even under the best of circumstances. And we, and most of them, the area that where trees are removed will not be you, know, you can't replant trees in what is now a transit lane or something. Um, but we would like to try to find a systematic way to enhance the canopy, tree canopy throughout the city. And the idea that we're exploring first is to have a neighborhood tree planting um, program where we identify neighborhood by neighborhood, perhaps over the course of several years, and offer trees to residents in those neighborhoods that they can plant in their property uh, to, you know, if it's one tree at a time per property, that helps ultimately expand the canopy. And 
there are areas in the city, as you know, that have really dense, beautiful tree cover and others less so. Mm -hmm. uh, and the ones that have less tree cover, there's a variety of reasons for that. In some neighborhoods, it, there are view sites that, you know, the view corridors that people don't want big trees. But in other neighborhoods, I think it is almost a socioeconomic phenomenon where uh, people uh, can't see to, in their budget, to buy trees. Trees are expensive. If you buy a tree that's already big enough to plant and be successful, uh, they often may be uh, renting properties or one thing or another. And so the first area we've identified is sort of in Northwest Lake Forest Park, lots of um, small houses on small light lots that are often um, with very little tree cut canopy. And so we want to try to um, focus on that area first. And if that turns out to be successful, we could move around the, the community neighborhood by neighborhood to in a program like this. There are very limited number of places on public property where we can do much tree planting. Um, and so if we want to enhance the canopy, it's gonna to have to be finding places like that. Fantastic, thank you. Councilman Weeble. Thank you, Mr. Olmstead, for the presentation and discussion. And I want to acknowledge and appreciate the work that you and your tree board do for Lake Forest Park. Um, as a volunteer group, it's always difficult to find time and volunteers, but very much appreciate the work you did and do. I want to touch on the subject that you just spoke of, which is the 520 expansion that Sound Transit is proposing. And you touched on some things that uh, I, I'm very pleased to hear. Uh, you won't be able to plant the trees back in the number that were already there because the area that you have to plant has now actually been reduced by the lanes and the sidewalks that are installed. You also touched on uh, there are areas along 520 that are, as homeowners will consider as view corridors to whether it be the lake, the Cascades, or Mount Rainier, that would not be very appreciative if um, pine trees were planted in front of their views. But you also highlight something that uh, really need to think about, and I'm glad you are, which is where to plant the trees in Lake Forest Park that Sound Transit is going to have to replace. Uh, in fact, they're going to have to replace more trees than the trees that they remove. And uh, as you point out, it's going to be difficult to find places. So I'm glad that you're thinking about that. And while you didn't talk about it as part of your work plan, it sounds as though that's part of the work that you're going to be doing. Yes. The other is I seem to recall that Sound Transit partnered with the city of Shoreline to have a program where homeowners could um, have trees that they could then plant on their property to, again, to augment the trees that were being removed yep. and then spread around the city of Shoreline. And I think they had some financial assistance that was available to yeah. help in that process. I don't know about the Shoreline's one, but the city of Seattle has one. It's okay. called their Neighborhood Tree Program or Neighborhood Tree Planting Program or something. And it's pretty much just exactly what we would like to start doing here. I think it's, I don't know if it may be widely available in Seattle, but in our goal here would be to focus on areas that are where the tree canopy is the most limited. So I do I do believe that Sound Transit did partner with the city of Shoreline for that. such a program. So it would Thank be, you. I think, helpful to look at. Um, are you also involved in reviewing what Sound Transit is proposing to plant back in the areas that they then need to clear and grub? We haven't seen any proposals about that yet. I don't know if they're available or if they're just at the phase of trying to figure out what they're going to remove. So, and, and as far as I'm aware, it's not clear yet whether they are going to take responsibility for replanting or if they are going to want some community group to be responsible for that. I believe that Sound Transit will be required and okay. that they will need to plant more trees than that, that which they remove. Yeah. But as you point out, they're going to have an issue of where to plant them. Yeah. And so to the extent that we can help them find appropriate places, um, I think that might they might be more willing to help. The people we really need to talk to are the uh, Seattle Public Utilities, whoever has the the uh, reservoir at Horizon View. Yeah. There is, you know, if you look at Google Maps, yeah. right, yeah. that is the biggest untreated area in our town, yeah. apart from the town center. Yeah. Um, apparently, um, they are un, they're reluctant to plant trees in that big grassy expanse that surrounds the reservoir. I'm not sure yeah. why the reservoir is covered. It's not like they have to worry about debris getting in the water. Thank you. 
Um, That's yeah. about my pay grade. <laughs> Deputy Mayor French, then um, Council Member Bodie, then Council Member Castlever. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, thank you very much for your presentation and all the hard work that you do. A couple of things. One, uh, the Heritage Tree Program, I that jogged my memory, and there, I, I can think of only two trees that I remember on the list. One is, and I'm sure there's dozens, um, one is over here on 47th in a little triangle that, that's maintained by a, a group of volunteers, a massive um, fir, I believe, and then there's a deciduous tree that's at Animal Acres that has a diameter of like eight feet or something it's a pretty it's my daughter's favorite tree and I walk by it every day so I just had to give a shout out to her favorite tree um one of the things my my colleague Mr. Lebo teed this up about sound transit uh, the question of replanting in other areas um one of the things that I've been very uh, passionate about as a policymaker is kind of doing an inventory of the assets that the community has in terms of natural the natural environment we have more than I'm guessing 25 plus acres of property that we hold uh, that is that is an unheralded property within this community. And uh, many of those have sort of scrubby uh, deciduous trees that have come in, you know, after they've been cut multiple times over, over generations. And, and many of these properties were acquired in the early nineties through King County Conservation Grants. And I would suggest that, um, that relative to sound transit, if we can find a way to herald those properties and suggest that those are alternative properties to plant trees and remove some of the ones that are sort of low, um, uh, I don't know how to describe it, but they're, they're they're less desirable than the ones that we would like to see. Early succession species probably. Sure, would sure. Like think, to get, yeah. ac accelerate the succession yes. to things like native conifers or something. Yeah, and and I think it's really important for us to, as a community to find a way going forward with limited resources that we have that we we recognize and 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 um, illustrate to the community that these properties are held by the, by the citizens of Lake Forest Park and they're just not developed because they're wetlands or because they are um, green um, areas that are uh, for environmental uh, reasons being held. And uh, I think that there's an opportunity there, as Mr. Lebo said, to find alternative places for these plantings, rather than necessarily working with Seattle Public Utilities can be challenging on a very good day, um, uh, with all due respect to our friends there. But if we can find places around the community that make sense, as well as to, to uh, finding places for trees and a program that helps the underserved, like you were saying in the Northwest corner, because a lot of that area was sort of deforested the 60s and 70s and, and and various properties were built out there. But if you need any assistance in terms of the sort of counting of those properties, I'm sure there's somebody within the city that can help you with that. Or I'd be happy to guide you as well. I might ask Riley to look into that. And since he's our city staff liaison and see if he can come up with a list of those properties. You bet. Be great. I'd be happy, happy to, to give him a quick primer on it as well. <laughs> Council Member Bodie, and by the way, one other tree is the pianos tree in their front yard. Yeah, that's right. right. That's right. That's a huge tree. It's massive. Um, thank you very much. This is great. Um, I appreciate your work plan for the uh, year ahead. I'd also like to emphasize the uh, replanting associated with the Sound Transit project. I I think that it would be timely to start thinking about that now because uh, my colleague, Council Member Lebo, has emphasized how important it is to have our plans for replanting so Sound Transit doesn't feel it can just write a check. Uh, we want the replanting to occur and we want it to occur as part of the project. Um, I, I think my colleagues' ideas are all good. I think your idea about community planting is very good, but I want to encourage you to also think about the actual corridor and what we can do with the actual corridor. You know, can we, how can we, like, if you look up on Bothell Way, there are some trees planted along the retaining walls up there uh, in Bothell. Yeah. Um, and so what can we do to retain that sense of a green corridor that we have um, along and, and what kind of uh, plantings could we do that fit into 
kind of a, a narrow space with irrigation, I assume, uh, but uh, give us that visual greenery. Uh, we, I, there is talk about putting vines on the wall, but I'm talking about trees. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I guess we there need to see what the setback is from the street, right? To be able right. to put trees in. In Bothell, there's a significant setback there. And, uh, you know, we'll have to see, I guess, what the yes. plan calls. And on, on the lakeside, you know, we are going to have a, a sidewalk on the downhill side. And so perhaps there's an opportunity in a small space to do some skinny tree planting, yeah. but still <laughs> retain that green corridor. That That's something that is the way you approach Lake Forest Park right now. And I'd like to not completely lose that. So if you have some good ideas, they would be welcome. Yeah, I think we would need to see final plans before you know you can actually start to think how you can configure replanting in there. But that's something I'm sure that the tree board would love to be engaged with. Yes, when the time and, comes. and possibly, Mr. Mayor, the sidewalk could be shrunk to create some space for the trees if that's the trade-off too. <laughs> so. <laughs> Anyway, that's thank you very much for for thinking about that and uh, uh, for your work plan. Councilmember Castover, and then I'll go back. Or actually, Council Castover and Goldman. Thank you. Great, thank you. I'm coming back again here. A um, couple of things. First of all, uh, the mayor and I both had very good conversations with the arborist, who is a consultant to Sound Transit, and is actually looking at the um, whole tree plan uh, and what's coming down and what can be saved and what they need to do to save what they can. Um, we found him to be quite um, amenable to uh, our community's focus on preserving the trees and, you know, very supportive. And we wondered, um, or I wonder whether it might be possible for the city administration to arrange for him to come and spend some time with the tree board. We would so, love to have him yes, attend uh, a tree board meeting. And, yeah, yeah. And, I, and so I will, the mayor and I will work on that, see what we can do. Um, and then the last thought I'd like to leave you with, um, I often in my time here on the council have had to apologize for various invasives that have come from my home country. <laughs> um, <laughs> Holly, English Holly, English warm Ivy, beer. English. <laughs> no. <Warm beer. laughs> It's not, it's not warm, it's summer temperature. Oh, we'll sorry. talk about I this. <laughs> um, and, well, and the blackberries. And so um, I hope, I do, do see in your plan that you have, uh, you know, the possibility of more public education about invasives, but I worry tremendously about the harm that the ivy is doing in mm -hmm. particular to our trees. And I wonder if it's time for another really big push uh, of public education to, and advice to homeowners as to the best methods of removing the ivy from the trees that are in the, on their properties. So any help I can give you on that one, I'm happy to do. So um, I yeah, feel like know, I said, a bit of responsibility there. That's a, a critical issue and we did two years ago have or two or three years ago have an, an ivy removal a contest right and uh we haven't gone back to that in part because we realized there was no good way to measure the uh, <laughs> you know remove the most ivy so we ended up giving all four of the contestants a three which was the the prize for that um, project but I, w it is something where having some way to uh, educate around it would be good. I'd live adjacent to an undeveloped area that's directly across 40th place from Five Acre Woods. And there's an area equally as large as Five Acre Wood that is completely overgrown with ivy up in there. It's all privately owned property. None of the landowners seem to care. Um, some of the properties are, I've looked at the plat maps. There are some properties in there that are inaccessible for any street but are you know owned by not the people who live on the street next to them so i that's it's really hard to know what how you would even get at uh a project like even getting the ivy off the trees much less off the ground which is just as bad yeah i think you know we we've had a big push on that there's an oops, sorry uh, we've had a big push on that in the past, and 
uh, we will get back to that for sure. Good, and I would just I would just like to make note of the fact that we have a lot of turnover here in Lake Forest Park in population, and so when we think we've done something, <laughs> um, now we're faced with the fact that maybe 10-15% of our of our homeowners in our city <laughs> weren't here when we did that thing three years ago. So uh, you know, it is it is necessary to repeat ourselves, I think, more than we realize. And I'm sure we've all encountered the people who just say, oh, how lovely the ivy is. Yeah. Right? So it's not all in, in the McAleer Creek project. Oh, yeah. One of the large landowners up there refused to let uh, us remove ivy from his property. So I yeah, actually went and knocked on his door and got the same answer. So yeah, <laughs> yeah he was not impressed with that at all. Um, Councilmember Goldman. Um, yeah, uh, thanks for your presentation. I've enjoyed working with you and the rest of the board the, this past year. Um, I also wanted to touch on education. Um, it seems that, uh, especially with Sound Transit, there's going to be a lot more trees being planted on private property in the near future. And I'm wondering if you could touch on how the tree board might help to educate homeowners as to proper maintenance, especially for new saplings. Yeah, well, part of the plan for this neighborhood planting would be to have a uh, not only a tree that we give them, we don't aren't just going to dump a tree in their yard and say, you know, see you later, but give them information about how to properly plant, care for uh, water trees until they're established. So that would be, you know, homeowner targeted education. Um, we're going to have a table at the Green Fair in April, and one of the things we want to do there is have some uh flyers and things that we can hand out about both the value of trees but also the importance of planting and maintaining trees um those are things that we specifically we have in mind um but any other ideas we would be interested in sharing it sandy and mandy are two of the two new tree board members the, the newest tree board members are both are very interested in the education and outreach component of the board's responsibilities Anybody else? We have a anybody. Okay, um, I'm going to throw a few things out at you. One, ever since I started the tree board, I want that pamphlet done. I want, I'm sorry? I want the pamphlet. I want one to go to every person who buys a house or rents a house. Oh yeah. Park. But I know I put a couple of people, Mandy and Sandy, on that just for that reason. Yeah. Um, I will take responsibility to figure out how to get some money for you guys because I really like that one out there. Okay. But while I'm thinking about it, I think I'm going to have the stream keepers put a little note in there. And I think we should put one about Ivy in there too. Maybe, but I will get a hold. I would like to talk to them and deal with that. Okay. Okay. I will say I'm not giddy about how many people are on the tree board. I know I'm working on that right now, but I will try. And I would love it if you guys can promote that at the Green Fair. Okay. Yeah, so that would be a good place to talk to people. Yeah, that's coming up. Um, go ahead, a couple other ones. But I'm I'm really happy with what you guys are doing. So thank you very much. But I really do believe the education is something that we need to know because I know there's a lot of houses that get sold. Oh, you can cut those trees down. The view will be beautiful. Well, mm. you know, that doesn't seem to work real well in Lake Forest Park. And yeah. like Larry says too, it'd be great. And I last thing I'd like to say, Larry's going to be there a while. Um, we will get people on the thing. I don't want to see that arborist name change much more. Yeah. And sure. my, my deal to that is everybody in the city Please respect our arborist. They don't yeah. make the yeah. they do straight. They do not make the rules. They do yeah. not do anything. They're just doing the best they can, and they are people too. And yeah. and we as a city need to figure out how we can actually enforce what we want to do. But please, I don't want to see that name change yeah. for a while. Okay, so thank you very much. Well, that part one of the education <laughs> components that we have in mind is trying to find a way, find out what have been the the um, points of friction, especially around tree permits mm -hmm. and educate specifically around that. Or if there's a way that we can make the process smoother around that, because you don't have to be on the tree board or in the community very long talking to people about tree removal permits before you start hearing stories that- I think we're know. very fortunate right now to have a arborist and I stop by and talk to her quite often, but she's real on top of that. And she, yeah. I think maybe real, you work with her. She's really can probably tell you. I'm exactly. getting to know her now. I'm yeah, she's happy really, with her. Yeah, she's really good. So um, with that, I think we'll let you go. And um, thank you very much. You're doing a great job. And I'll get you some more people, okay? Okay, yeah. good. Thank, thank you, you, Richard, very much. <laughs>
All righty, folks, um, we'll move on to citizens' comments. <clears throat> Chief, you're doing a great job tonight. <laughs> One, name on One name on the list. Okay. Okay. Heather Scoggins, how, how do you say that? Are you, would you like to speak? Come on up. Just say your name and maybe you have three minutes and welcome. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for listening. My, my name's Heather Skogerson and my husband and I own a mobile coffee shop called Skog House Coffee that we park in front of um, the local 104 with our tiny shiny caffeine machine. And we've been there almost two years now. Um, it's been a really rough winter. There was a lot of cold days that we had to close. Um, we have a big uh, door that opens up to the elements and uh, the snow kept us from making it down. The cold kept us from opening quite a few days. One of our, few of our customers reminded us of the smoke in the summertime too and how hard that was on us. And our next step is to somehow find a brick and mortar space that works for us in our community. About 75 to 80% of our customers are local neighbors that just walk up or drive up. Um, so staying in this area is really what we'd like to do. Um, I made a comment out to our social media um, platform asking our customers um, what their thoughts are for just being really creative, finding a creative solution for staying in this area in Lake Forest Park. Um, a strip mall, the town center isn't necessarily where we'd like to be. Um, we like the area that we're in right now and it's zone neighborhood businesses. I've asked um, the city and they've given me maps that show where neighborhood businesses are located and there's not a lot of options for places where customers can walk from their homes to some place like a coffee shop. Lake Forest Park doesn't have anything at all like that. Um, so it's our desire to bring that to the community and just work on creative solutions to find something that's like that or find out what might be zoned for the possibility of that um, that isn't just well known right now. This is this is just me starting this search. So a lot of what I've looked for, it's been kind of hard to find in regards to neighborhood business um, zoning areas and also um, any kind of economic development by the city for small businesses like ours to flourish in Lake Forest Park. So my question is to you guys, what that might be, where that might be, um, if there's any suggestions or thoughts on moving in the future. It sounded like listening to Sam talking about the planning for Lake Forest Park, um, that maybe there's some thoughts into how, how the community might grow and offer more of that to small businesses like ours. Thank you. Thank Before you. we can't answer you right now. Nope, that's fine. Thank no, you. But I, <laughs> I appreciate your time. I do love your trailer. I've thought about it many times. I almost hooked up to it one day and you were still in it. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks for being here. Um, nobody else in the audience like speak this time? Do we have anybody online? Um, if you want to address the council, uh, please use the raise hand function. And look like it, Mr. Mayor. Okay. At this time, we'll close citizens' comments. From here, we're going to go on. We have an executive session pending potential litigation per RCW42.30.110.1i. Um, at this time, we're going to put 30 minutes for the executive session. Uh, there will be a closed section following that on collective bargaining per RCW42.130.140.4b. Um, we do not put a time on that. So we'll be doing a half hour on the first. We're going to be doing downstairs council and we'll let you know when that's over and then we'll be moving on. Um, for everybody out there, um, I don't think we're making, are we, we're doing no decisions afterwards, correct? Okay, so if you can go and go home and enjoy yourself, you're more than welcome. If you want to sit here and hang out with the chief for an hour, hour, whatever. <laughs> uh, Mr. Mayor, so, sir, yes. point of order, we do have action items on um, 12 on the agenda. But not, a, not on. But not, not related not to the related executive related session. session. Yeah, yes, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, okay, at this time we will.
So moved. Second. And second. Any other discussion? Aye. 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 Like passing unanimously. Thank you. On to ordinance and resolutions for introduction refer ordinance 23-1265 amending the municipal code to allow alternates on boards and commissions and related draft resolutions. Uh, I guess Matt has this one. Yep. All righty. <laughs> right. Um, and you guys kind of know how I feel about that already. This one kind of looks cut off on me. There we go. So this is to allow um, alternates on boards and commissions city. Um, this ordinance would amend certain sections of the code for to allow alternates specifically and the volunteer commission. Um, what is it? Volunteer. Volunteer commissions, I guess it's just called volunteer commissions. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the other parts of the code for the salary commission, the parks and rec record recreation advisory board and the tree board. And also in the packet is two resolutions to add alternates for the climate action committee and the library advisory board. Okay. Great. So if you have any questions. Yes, Councilmember Lebo. So it's less a question then. Um, I guess when I, this came up, I was thinking of it as vacancies rather than abstentions. Meaning, if I understand this correctly, this applies to when a member is not present, yeah. as opposed to when a member is uh, has a vacant position. And so I was beginning to think about it. And realistically, though, do we have an issue where members are not showing up? I seem to have thought that the issue that we were trying to address was not absenteeism, but rather vacancies. Well, and so I, I'm, it seems overly complicated to have alternates if the issue is absenteeism, because I don't think that that's really an issue. And that these boards and commissions, though, like the planning commission has to, they spend a lot of time and effort um addressing a particular issue and is it really worthwhile to have an alternate for them to catch up to speed they need to go to all the the, the meetings but that they, they would only be contributing if someone didn't show up at that meeting and i'm not sure that that's really an issue well, so i it seems seems like we're trying to address uh, a, a a non-issue, which is absenteeism, as opposed to vacancies. I'm actually looking at vacancies. You're not the one who has to cut. You know, I'm always looking. We always are. People just disappear halfway through a year. They just have they move, and so what we happen is, well, I'm just kind of getting while well, the iron's hot and having people that's interested. Like, what we I would like to have two people out there that know what's going on. They can come to the meetings. They can't vote or anything, but if so so just goes and then all of a sudden i'm scrambling to find people and then i have like the tree board saying hey i need down i'm down people and that's pretty much my whole entire i've been mayor it's been that way we're always down on people and so right now we have a lot of people that are interested now covid's over i've got people that are some really good people and they've actually when i've been interviewing them saying that you know this isn't you know this isn't just for you're going to start tomorrow if we want to put you in like the bullpen and if when when we need somebody, we have somebody ready to go, so we're not leaving the commissions. Especially right now, I've got a parks board that's got a whole lot coming on, and they that's they really need to stay full. And Lori will attest to that. That if they somebody goes, they're going to need somebody to fill them in. So it's not for absenteeism; it's just to have somebody lined up there. I don't have to go scrambling for three months to find somebody. That's the way I was looking at it. So I'm um, just yes, I've got everybody. I'm going to go with you. I'm always looking at you. I'm going to go with Councilmember Goldman, Councilmember Fairtown, and Councilmember Riddle. 
Um, yeah, I, I'm in favor of this. Uh, part of the challenge with the tree board is I think we had at least three people resign unexpectedly, and that's put us in a hole that we're still crawling out of. Um, I do have a question about this. Let's say we're in a place where the tree board has seven positions and we have seven plus an alternate. If one of the seven resigns unexpectedly, would the alternate still be an alternate or would they automatically become like a normal board member in, in like for the remainder of that term? My intention is a normal board member, but why there'll be an alternate A and the first guy that comes off, the alternate would go in and they go, yes, ma'am. It's Maybe not, the, it's not currently written that way, but we could draft, we could make revisions. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that was my intent. Yeah, yeah I, I see it kind of like the, the Miss America style where in the event that they can't fulfill their duties, then the alternate becomes Miss America for all intents and purposes. Well, that's two, free uh, and Miss America. I've heard two things tonight that I haven't ever heard on this yet. <laughs> <laughs> Council Mayor for a time. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you, Clerk McLean, for uh, putting this together and your presentation. Um, the question, the, the, to address Council Member Lebo's point, though, um, I think it's both. I think we need to not just fill in the alternates as on the tree board, but we also need to be able to have quorum at meetings. And so it's been something of an issue on the Climate Action Committee, where sometimes we don't have uh, six people. And so uh, five people, sorry. And so it'd be great to have somebody there to establish quorum. It does mean that the uh, alternate yeah. would have to attend the meetings, and that's fair. Um, I'm currently on Lake Valange form. I'm an alternate, but when the mayor can't be there, I get to be the voting member, but I need to know what's going on. So I think there would be a certain expectation that the alternates would attend the meetings, even if they don't get to vote at that particular meeting. And I guess the question that I have then is that if there's a meeting that has a quorum, but not the full complement of members, um, would the alternate get to vote? Yeah. Okay. Yes, that would be, they would turn into a, a almost de facto member of the board for that meeting. Okay, great, thank you. Oh yes, Council Member Riddle. <laughs> thank you. Uh, my colleagues uh, asked very similar questions to what I was was trying to understand. And I think um, adding that language, as, as was mentioned, uh, that someone's automatically promoted to a position come a vacancy. And I think uh, clarity that, that finishing that term doesn't constitute a full term. I think as we have language for folks who are are filling um, a partial term and just clarifying that as an alternate who's promoted there has that same sort of, uh, we don't count the partial term to their term limit. Um, and then I think adding the language about the hierarchy as, as the mayor was suggesting that we know which one would be promoted first and come a vacancy, I think would be really useful. And then language in here around, um, I was starting to type it, so now I can't remember what it was. Um, the, the 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 temporary promotion to 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 fulfill a quorum or to be able to vote, I think, kind of mentioning that sort of like a temporary promotion to a, a voting member for the meeting at which point the alternate is needed. I, I think maybe some more clarity around that language, just so that um, we don't have questions later. So if we can get some extra language in there that way, I think I'd appreciate that. The only uh, sort of other element here is we seem to have the same language in multiple places. And I'm starting to ask you to add a lot of language. Is there a way we could simplify and put it in one language and reference back to that section in the other areas? It's just a way to make our lives a little easier in the future. So if you would Pro think about how that might work. Probably not, but- Oh, there's a hand over here. <laughs> Some of these, um, we, we've done that with the commissions that are in chapter 2.22. So they will all reference back to that one section that's drafted as an amendment. But the others, you could also refer back to that, but they are in completely different code sections. They're treated differently. So that wouldn't be my recommendation, but we could, because we don't refer back to chapter 2.22 for those commissions it's a little okay so things that are within that chapter we could do a reference outside the they chapter all... we'd like to have the duplication of the language that's how it's, for simplicity that's how it's drafted right now okay thank yeah. you for that clarification yes. on one point i am um, the, uh, the real life scenario is happening to me right now you, you guys saw sam today fantastic we're, we're really lucky we got a we, we got a full commission right now i do know that in six months there's a guy leaving 
I did interviews yesterday. One of the people I interviewed yesterday has done comp plans. He's all ready to go. And I want him sitting there. And I, mean, I have no problem with him going to the meetings because he'll be right there. And when that guy goes off, I don't have to scramble. Mm -hmm. I don't say, oh, and then I have to go, I hope I find somebody has a comp plan. Somehow we've already got a guy in the wings that's ready to go, which is pretty exciting. And and that's just pointing out, it's been, especially during COVID, it's been really hard to get anybody to volunteer. And between them, all their advertising, I guess, we've been doing has really helped. So that's just why I'm trying to make it smoother for the commissions to move forward. Yes, Council Member Castle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, thank you for your work on this and and to, and for our city clerk's work. Um, I'm in favor of this idea. Uh, I've been an alternate in a number of committees since my time on the council uh, of regional committees and then moved up to full voting member when other people left. And um, I think if we, you know, I think it'll be up to council, you and the council, as we interview people who are alternates to kind of test how um, willing they are to give of their time to keep up with the issues uh, during their alternate service, knowing that they could be called upon to vote or if somebody's absent or on vacation. Or, <clears throat> and I, I, I really do understand that we, with a number of our commissions, we're approaching some very significant work here. The comp plan with the planning commission, the tree board is really gearing up here. The Parks Board is going to have some very serious work to do now with the planning of the um, Waterfront Park. And um, and the uh, Climate Action Committee is gearing up also to really, you know, identify a significant plan with implementation ideas and budget and all those things. So I, I foresee this as being a, a, a particularly busy time for the city in which continuity and um, <clears throat> being able to really stick to a schedule is really important. And I guess, you know, my experience during the pandemic when we were trying very hard to get the planning commission's work completed in time to complete the town center uh, work before a legal deadline that we had it was just really hard because of vacancies and um, times when the planning commission was working. So I'm, I applaud you, Mr. Mayor, for asking for this um, uh, to be put into some language and get it before us. And I, I'm in full support. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I completely agree with my colleague. I think this is really important. Anything we can do to streamline the um the work of our various boards and commissions is essential and it is as the mayor indicated uh it is can be very challenging we've had it's been sort of feast or famine when it has come to volunteering on some of these uh bodies and and as uh, vice chair Cassover indicated we have some really substantive work coming down the pike and it is uh i i really appreciate the analogy of mr mayor of working on creating a deep bench. I think that's really important for us to do. Uh, it's, you know, it's baseball season coming up here and and I think that's an apt analogy. And I, I do, we so value the work of our volunteers. And when we have willing people that are applying for these positions, uh, let's, let's get them in, into the mix and give them, give them some opportunities when, when they arise, because uh, in the past we haven't had that opportunity. The one question I did want to bring up and the mayor prompted me about this is the question of whether we should be adding this to the governance manual. We had talked about that. And maybe in this case, with these ordinances, revision of the ordinance and the addition of the other one, maybe what's your advice, Mr. Clerk? Um, there was some confusion about whether or not the governance manual actually applied to commissions. It should. It's not written completely that way. So it's probably a good idea to add it okay. to it. But this will take care of our immediate problem. Yeah. We can we can dot our I's across our T's going forward. Yeah. Thank you for the answer. Yes, <clears throat> Councilmember Bodie, then Councilmember Lebo again. Yes, thank you very much. Um I uh I'm liaison to two of our uh, our groups, our citizen groups, 
And uh, occasionally there has been an issue with a quorum, but it helps to pull people ahead of time and remind them to come. And so our two respective chairs have been doing that. I really don't want the adoption of this approach to send a signal to our uh, primary members that they can miss meetings. <laughs> <laughs> so I I do think we Unintended have to consequences. Yes, <laughs> yes, we have to think about that and how we uh how we provide those messages. And I, I wanted to say the um the chair of the Parks and Recreation Board last night had a meeting and he um he zoomed in from India where he was on work assignment and it was 7.30 in the morning instead of nighttime there. And he was flying out that day oh and he still zoomed in to chair the meeting. So uh, I, I realized that not everybody probably will do that, but uh, we do have some uh, really committed members who try never to to miss meetings. So, and I also think if people miss meetings too frequently, then they should be prompted to step down and let the alternate step in. So, I'm more thinking about the what happens down the road and what uh what impression we give to the commission members. So. Uh, this is an ongoing issue, but I do support this this approach. Thank you, Councilmember Lebo. Yeah, I appreciate the conversation discussion from my colleagues. That's very helpful for me. If um, there's strong support for this, so if you have two alternates but only have one person absent, you might think about what's the process to decide which of the alternates is in fact uh, <laughs> part of the quorum. The other is, I think there is a separate manual for commissions and boards with regard to sort of governance. Um, and that might be a place where you would insert maybe a provision that if you miss so many um, meetings that you are no longer an active board member. That's a good point. But I do believe we already have a separate uh, commission and board guide. So that I wouldn't want to encumber that onto the council's governance uh, manual. Mm -hmm. So, um, Kim, I think you, have uh, a, you both there, have... there actually is an attendance um, policy already in our municipal code for volunteer commissions. Um, I think it's no less than three scheduled meetings in a six month period. Here, I can just share it. Remember, we don't do math on TV, Matt. I know. <laughs> I'm like trying to read this, and I'm like, uh. so moving forward, we need to we write this, look into some stuff. But we're we're, we're in agreement. We want to move forward mm -hmm. with this direction we're going. Right. Well, there it is. Commissioner okay. is consistently absent for more than fifty percent or more of the meetings in a twelve month period, or missing the next meeting following a twelve month period where commissioner attended less than fifty percent of scheduled meetings. During the commissioner's term, the mayor will declare that there is a vacancy on the commission and a new appointment process will begin. Wow. Okay. So we you have your marching orders, so let's go. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Got that, Kim? Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Sure. We could move your desk down there, then you wouldn't have to leave your yeah, desk. I would like that very much. <laughs> <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> know that okay now on to ordinance and resolution for council discussion ordinance 23.1266 amending chapter 16.16250 of the lake forest park municipal code reasonable use exemption to allow for reasonable economic use yes welcome haven't seen you for a long Thank time you, Mayor. long time yeah <laughs> um so uh i uh, it's, uh, I have some new information to present if it, uh, council would like to go over that. And um, what, uh, as uh, we don't, as you uh, will note, that there's there's not a new, they're not, they're not um, alternative um, language uh, 
possible uh, proposals in in this current draft. But I think you know we could open with just this new information, talk about the history of um, uh, RUEs, and and then see kind of where that goes. Because um, one of the things that the planning commission did was just spend a little time well, before they made the recommendation. Uh, just understanding kind of what the history of the reasonable use exception was, and and uh, what, you know what what what's uh, what's occurred out there, and so um, our um, city clerk McClane has a has a PDF of both of these um, documents that you uh, got a copy of, which is just a table of all the reasonable use exception applications, and then. Um, uh, earlier today, I just um, kind of quickly superimposed a PDF of our critical areas map with um, the applications. So yeah, we, we could just start there, uh, Matt, thank you. Uh, so that table you have uh, is, uh, they're, they're actually um, have been only 12 applications since 2005. Uh, and that was, so that started shortly after uh, this, uh, an update of the critical area code was, was done which uh, in the state at that time required that uh, cities not have a variance process in their critical areas regulations. You had to uh, take out the variance process and put in this reasonable use option. And so it was a much tougher criteria than what was previously. And you could get a variance in pretty much anything in the, in the, in the critical areas code before that. Um, but soon after uh, that, we did get our first application in, in 2005, that one, um, didn't really go anywhere um, because of uh, public um, opposition to it in the in the area, uh, and and so what you know that and that is a common um, aspect of this that there because we have a process where you the notice of application is sent to people within a certain distance, and then the same thing with the notice of hearing. Uh, there, there is a lot of public comment on, on every single one of these things, and that's why you'll see applications. You know, even the most recent ones are from. Um, 2020 and 2021, uh, and they still haven't gotten to hearing. And a lot of it has to do with uh, just, you know, responding to staff um, <clears throat> comments about, you know, is this really um, the minimum you can you can do? And and you know, or, or can can you get reasonable use out of it by um, <clears throat> by doing so, doing something less so there is less uh, or, or changing the site uh, so that's you know it's it's uh, some midpoint between. This stream and this uh, wetland over here, or this steep slope, could you? So we, we go through a lot of that before we even get to a staff recommendation, and so that's why you see that kind of lag. The other things uh, <clears throat> I point out about this table is uh, where you see uh, no under the next to the last column uh, there, whether it's a question of whether it's built or not. It could be a couple of things. Uh, one, like the first one I was just saying, didn't get to hearing uh, because the um, applicant kind of abandoned the whole project, but it's still out there. Someone else, you know, it uh, could could bring that back for reasonable use. So all of these things are still potential, even though there's only 12 of them, um, and, and they involve 15 lots. The other thing could be that, like the ones, um, the more recent ones, that there's been no hearing because they haven't, uh, you know, responded to all of our comments, or you know, they put it on hiatus. A lot of that happened during the pandemic. Things just, you know, stopped moving forward. But you know, these these last two, Koaha and uh, Gary, 11 and 12, are uh, still in process. Um, so, uh, and, and in some cases, uh, we did have one that actually involved three lots, um, uh, number five, Chin, and um, that was that that was actually a sub an old subdivision that had four lots in it. And so we were able to talk them out of trying to get all four lots developed and, and recommended approval as reasonable use. These are just steep slope lots, so there's you know and not a whole lot. Is they're right on the backside of. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the, the park by the reservoir, which is named escaping me right now. Um, and um, and so there, you know, actually were a pretty, pretty good uh, compromise on, on that piece of property. Um, and um, so, so then, if, uh, Matt, if we could put up the map, I just thought it would be useful to kind of have a sense of where did these things occur? Um, I didn't have when we were talking about the planning commission, um, so, but you know, you can you can see the the number five up there at the top uh, is uh, it's kind of like uh, this this map is so busy. I'm sorry that the the number uh, the information is kind of buried in there. It's a little kind of like where's Waldo? But the RUE is up there uh, in the far right corner. That's that's that Chin property where the three properties are, are right behind um, 
uh, the um, Horizon View Park. And number 12 at the top, that's the most recent application, which you, you, you're probably very familiar with, the Gary um, uh, property up there right uh, against the creek. And, um, but you'll also know that, you know, of course, we had our one number nine or our one um, reasonable use for exceptional tree. And of course, those two trees that um, were built within the uh, critical root zone are still there. And the, the, the resolution turned out pretty well. We've got a, a $60,000 bond to, to ensure the, uh, the um, <coughs> continuance of, of the health of those trees. So that uh, keeps the uh, owner and the um, developer involved. Um, I, I think you know that uh, the probably the most per, important part of the map, like putting this on the map, is just kind of show the cluster of RUEs along 28th. And the the reason there are so many uh, is because uh, you know the city, you know, one of the downsides of of you know setting a goal to do the right thing and get sewer in all areas is that that is really what made these lots developable. They had set dormant because they're they're all in a wetland or in a stream buffer, and there's no way a septic system would ever work there. So when we put the sewer in, it you know is a logical conclusion that people are now going to see that that you know they can get reasonable use out of these properties, and that's why you have so many along there. You've got um, uh, one you know you'll see that there's a, a three and six on the um, the chart, uh, Gorman and Johnson. That is the same property. It it. Uh, uh, it got approved, it expired, and then somebody came back, I bought the property, Johnson bought it and built in there, built on that one. And um, so then the, the, uh, the other, um, there's, there's um, two others that are actually built. And um, so they, uh, and then we have uh, one across the street, which is actually two lots, 10, Matson. That one's kind of, uh, you know, it's kind of dormant, but it, it, they could come back, they just haven't responded to uh, whatever our information requests were, but it, it could uh, start moving again. Um, so, so that's kind of the uh, what I wanted to tell you about the map. So I'd be happy to answer any questions or talk about uh, anything you want to related to the, the draft uh, regulations we've uh, been looking at. Thanks, Councilmember Riddle. So just a quick question. Can I, when I look at the um, Excel sheet, it looks like we had five, um, RUEs in the first 10 years and then seven in the next five. Um, mm -hmm. Can you refresh my memory when we updated the critical areas ordinance and do you, was, is that maybe yeah, was, part of the reason of, after of the one additional I mentioned, ones now? There was the 2017 update of the code that was um, um, required um, through growth management. We had to do address best available science, things like that. But it didn't, I don't think it changed those criteria uh, for for reasonable use, they, they've stayed pretty much the same okay. since the update in two thousand five or six. So it's likely this is an economic uh, incre increase because of economic pressures to to build more more property versus changes to the critical area ordinance. Yes. Yes. Okay. I, I thank you for that fair assessment. Yeah. Yes, Councilman Bodie. Uh, I have a question um, about the the. Um, size of the both applied for and granted um, RUEs. So what is the largest, assuming, first of all, are these all two-story structures that have been applied for? Uh, assuming yes, what's the largest that's been applied for and granted and the smallest that's been applied for and granted? Well, I think we could we could take a look at all of those decisions. There's there's only um, eight of them, and we can figure it out but by the next meeting. But I, I can't tell you offhand. But I can you I'm know pretty confident that, that they're all um, uh, right around um, eleven hundred or twelve hundred square feet in the footprint. Plus, as I was, uh, you know, uh, there, there's usually about ten to fifteen feet of usable area around that, and and that's. That's that's uh, really something I think you, we might want to get at is because that's really when we have enforcement issues, it's that it's it's really about that usable area around the house and how do you make sure that doesn't kind of creep outwards. So so, but um, I remember count my a colleague Council Member Riddle said that for a subdivision you have to have a thousand 
um, square feet a footprint, a buildable space. And yet for these exceptions uh, where people are actually being able to build more than the minimum for a subdivision as an as a quote unquote exception. Well, these these are uh, you know grandfathered in lots. Most of them are are huge. They're mm -hmm. a lot of them are over twenty thousand square feet, uh, and so as a you know as the applicant, I'm going to make the case that hey, look your 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 regulations are taking away uh, you know most of this huge lot where you know I if it, I I could you know I could. Uh, you can make that argument, you know, that this is a big yes. lot and I should be able to. So what's remarkable is how close those two numbers you cited are. Uh, that there was the hearing examiner never had uh, any any type of uh, guidelines about what the size should be. But, you know, that precedent was set early on. Uh, and and so we're always looking back at the last decision. Well, what did they, you know, what was the justification for that size? And And we're telling the applicants, this is what got approved last time. So, mm -hmm. you know, you, you can make your case for something else, but uh, something bigger, but the, they never succeed. Um, one last follow-up question, if I may. So the, our current ordinance says that you have, you have to still build the minimum size building that would be a reasonable economic use. And so is... And yet, in a subdivision, a reasonable economic use would be a thousand square feet. And yet, our hearing examiner has been allowing larger uh, building footprints than a subdivision lot might have. Well, as, I, as a more, it doesn't that seem like a more than reasonable economic use? Well, the the the, um, the sub the subdivision regulations. It's it's not actually in the subdivision regulations. I don't think. I think it's it's in the critical areas regulations where it says. If right. you're going to okay. subdivide uh, and yeah. there are critical areas on the site, you have to be able to find at least a thousand square feet of unencumbered area. Right. So the hearing examiner is not required to look at what he's looking at his section uh, of, of the code. And, and so, you know, I'm, I mean, it wouldn't be out of question for them to uh, hear an examiner to say, well, it says this over here and ask staff, why are you re recommending 1100? Yeah. But that, he's never done well, that. I, it's yes. To me, if it's reasonable over here to have a smaller footprint, why is it unreason unreasonable not to go bigger? You know what I mean? Uh, well, we should so, we should well, we should look back at the so, minutes yeah. from the council meetings where that was adopted. I think I remember uh, Councilmember Feeney was the one Don Feeney who I think brought that that issue up, and you know it, it caught traction. But I don't think there was any you know detailed finding about why that was the the right number. <laughs> Yes. How, however, there was at least the view that that was reasonable uh, from the city at the time. So I'm just uh, concerned that that we're authorizing structures that go beyond the minimum reasonable uh, uh, exception that we need to meet uh, to 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 have reasonable economic use. So I'll I'll stop it there. Yes, that's where it casts over. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and thank you for your work on this, um, Mr. Bennett. What, what I'm looking for here is a little bit more of a statement about why we're even doing any of this. <laughs> why um, we would prefer that uh, folks keep the footprint small or particularly keep the disturbed area small why we are looking for folks to not you know expand out their use of the property be beyond that 15 feet around the house and I, I don't see that in the ordinance and I would like to see that I would like to see a statement that indicates the values of the city as expressed in so many other areas of our code um the protection of the environment, the importance of the wetlands, the importance of um, our larger trees, the, um, the issues of climate change and tree canopy and you know all those things that we mention in other parts of our code. I would like to see that expressed here so that when uh, an applicant 
and their, you know, a developer and whoever else is advising them um, takes a look at our code, they know what it is we are looking for, mm -hmm. and they know what it is they need to demonstrate um, in their application to meet the values and the um, character of our city. So uh, I just would like to ask that in the next um, revision that we have of this, that such a statement be there. And I think that the language is available in other areas of the code that you could just pull in to this, but I'd be glad to help if you need any help. Can I ask a follow-up question before we move yeah. on to... Uh... Uh, I, you know, we certainly attorney Pratt and I can certainly talk about, you know, a, a draft of that, but I'd, I'd be interested as you're all commenting, where do you think that should be? Should it be in the reasonable use section or should it be a preamble like you find in the, the tree regulations? And, you know, I, I don't know that there's any, uh, you know, it's, I, I think if it's close to the reasonable use section, it, it's more valuable to the hearing examiner and staff, but I don't know if that's, you know, as far as ordinance construction, that that's really a good idea. Probably. Well, I would mean it to be really tied to the reasonable use exception. And um, so that it's very clear that this is the guidance of, you know, the policy guidance from the city council to both the hearing examiner and the applicants. Um, okay. So thank you. does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hey, Deputy Mayor Friends, thank council member for your time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and actually on point, uh, thank you, Vice Chair Casover. We've talked about sort of statements of intent in the past uh, when we were struggling with the town center code and trying to understand what the original town center vision, the, 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 the spirit of it was. We were looking for an understanding of what the intent was as it was written back in 2007 and, and going on forward. And I think that as we consider these kinds of, of land use um, sort of declarations, if you will, uh, of, of our the values of that that we hear out in our community. We need to think exactly about what uh, Vice Chair Casover was saying. Is sort of what the intent what the intent is, and and figure out a way. And to your point, Mr. Bennett, where does where should that actually go? But but it, I think in the short term, attaching it directly to what we're working on now, I think it's very important. But in the long term, I think it's also very important for us as policymakers to sort of make sure that we have a way to sort of anchor the intent, the spirit and the intent of what we decide when it comes to very specific um, important decisions like this, because we're, we're thinking back right now and we're trying to re re remember for example, the critical areas ordinance, the original iteration of the critical critical areas ordinance, none of us were, I don't believe, were involved in that. And the original, we were in this, this the revision of that, if I'm not incorrect, Mr. Bennett. But trying to dissect that and historically go back and figure out what it is is a little challenge. So I, I, I don't have an answer for it right now, but I think it's important for us to kind of bookmark that as something that we consider as policymakers to make sure these things are important to the community. We've heard this one over and over again. We've heard things about the tree ordinance and, and think about these are kind of the, the reasons why this body made these decisions. And I don't know what that form that takes, but a statement of intent, I think, and, and purpose makes a lot of sense, at least in this case. And we can figure out maybe a better vehicle for, for communicating what this body was intending should we choose to move forward with this this kind of change. I'll leave it there. Councilman Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Director Bennett, for your uh, presentation. Um, yeah, and uh, I'm in favor for having a statement of intent, as uh, Deputy Mayor has mentioned. Um, the tree board one is really effective, I think, at conveying what the intent of that was. And I also agree that the placement should be somewhere very close, as, uh, as Council Member Casover said, to where the reasonable use exception is going to be. Um, in, it's not only important for the people who are going to build and also for the um, hearing examiner, but also for future councils and future staffs to understand where we're coming from. As we're talking about, you know, we, we, I was thinking we'd have to call up Council Member Feeney and say, uh, what, what were we thinking at that time? Um, it's called forensics. Exactly. No, you don't want to do that. And uh, the other the, the other point I wanted to make was the um, having a statement like that also is um, 
a good marker. It basically allows us to kind of stop and say, okay, is this really what we're thinking? My mind has been all over the map on this, you know, whether there should be a certain square foot limit, you know, there's so, so other cities where I understand doing that sort of thing. <laughs> and that opens up all kinds of legal can of, can of worm kind of things. So I really kind of like the way we're going with this, where the statement of intent, yeah, right, it's not enforceable. But the fact is that basically it gives people a good guidepost as to what we were thinking at the time about how we are going to preserve what Lake Forest Park means. So I appreciate that a lot. Thanks, Council Member. Colleagues. Yeah. Council Member Goldman and then Council Member Lebo. Um, yeah, thanks for bringing this to us. I will concur with my colleagues. I think having a statement of intent um, and having it tied to the reasonable use exception is, is going to be a, a good way forward. Um, the talk about the tree code where there is an intent section got me thinking um, uh, because in the tree code, there is a separate reasonable use exception that applies just to trees. So my question for you, if we are modifying, I guess, the general RUE code, do we also have to make comparable modifications to the tree RUE code? I think it depends on the nature of your the changes you make. Uh, like, like we've all been talking about, the tree code does have a lot of preamble language that can be called upon uh, or looked at, you know, by the hearing examiner and staff. Um, but, you know, if, if after you have come up with what you think is appropriate for the critical areas version, then I, I would suggest you go back and look at, you know, is there something else we can add uh, or, or extract from that preamble and the tree code and, and add to the criteria? Because I've always, I've always felt that those criteria were kind of a first draft and that they <laughs> seem to have worked for, the, for, the, for our first tree RUE, but, uh, you know, I'm sure they could be better. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilman Lebo. Thank you. I, I would like to go a little further, and I appreciate um, the idea behind the preamble, and I think that's important because uh, describing what we think of as being important and what we were thinking at the time that we passed this is a value. But I also think that in recognition that our hearing examiner is doing a terrific job, absent uh, policy or guidance from the council that the hearing examiner will in effect have their own de facto policy which may be related to the square footage i would like us to go further and set maximum on disturbance and footprint and i think an example might be to look to would be the kirkland ordinance where they've established both disturbance and maximum square foot absent that um you know we're 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 giving our policy up to our hearing examiner to describe and enforce what we think might be reasonable. Okay, Councilman Bodie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Following up on that, I think that um, this could be part of the guidance as opposed to an outright requirement as it is uh, for the city of Kirkland. And so in our introductory section, we could actually provide some guidance to the hearing examiner on what we have been thinking about for uh, maximum floor area. And I, I, when I looked at the Kirk, I just pulled up the Kirkland language. Uh, and, oh, and I support the idea of also including uh, the disturbance uh, element uh, as well as again, as guidance um, as opposed to absolute requirements. But I'm I'm still thinking about that subdivision buildable lot, and if you actually look at the Kirkland language on um, the footprint, it's 750 no but no larger than 750 square feet, um, and a maximum gross floor area 1,500 square feet. So 750, 750, two stories. And uh, no, the attached garage not to exceed a footprint and gross area of 250 square feet. So it's right on that thousand square feet buildable um, lot. So I like the consistency of that. I like the detail in the Kirkland language, but if we can uh, draft some language for our consideration and further discussion that, uh, that includes that as as uh, guidelines um, for the hearing examiner uh, as part, and it could be in the preamble or intent statement or elsewhere. Uh, that would be, I think, very helpful for us for our further discussions. 
Okay, Council Member French, then Council Member Riddle, then we need to kind of get moving on. I have staff that are sitting into their house waiting for us to get to them. So I'd appreciate if we could get to them fairly soon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll be brief. Um, just a couple of thoughts. I, uh, what Council Member Bodie ma said makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, Mr. Furtani and I, um, are, I must be of the same mind here that I've been kind of back and forth on the square footage question and the, the, the introduction preamble, the various things. But I, I do believe that maybe it, it, it makes sense for us to consider some language. You know, I, I think we're all in agreement that some sort of introductory statement, preamble, whatever we're calling that, is 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 essential. And and I would like to see some. The, I I like equations. So what uh, Councilmember Bodie just suggested to us, the simplicity of it does resonate with me a lot. And I'd like to maybe I'd like to see that language in something in a form that we could consider as, as a body. The last thing I want to do is just clarify something I said earlier about the forensic question. Um, and it's not that we don't like having conversations with our past council members. We certainly do. It's just a question of, in the case of, for, for example, town center, uh, uh, council member uh, Phillips and I actually reached out to the chair of the original town center vision so we could get a firsthand account of what the intent of what, as chair, what his interpretation of it was. And it was very striking to hear, you know, how things had changed through time over a period of, of uh, gosh, almost 19, uh, 12 years, I guess it was. And and I think that, I think that's, that illustrates the point about, while it's, it's great to be able to reach out to those folks, uh, we're not going to be here on this dais all the, forever, and, and we will not have access to all of our friends forever. And so I think it's important for us to make sure that we do have a, a record that we don't have to search too deep for for future councils to work through. I'll leave it there. That's my help. Yeah, I agree with my colleagues. I think an intent paragraph or several paragraphs, whatever it takes for us to get that across is, is important. I think looking at total disturbance is really important because again, the, to my opinion, the purpose of this is to protect the critical areas, not to build a house. So keeping the focus on protection of the critical areas as being a first and foremost, how we develop this. And then I think the last piece would be is there a desire to relook at parking requirements? You know, can we reduce parking requirements uh, to, to, to take one of our residential parking spots to off street parking if off street parking is a legitimate option in that area? And again, what we're looking at is, is bringing down that disturbance as much as possible. So I'd be interested in, in some language around that for us to discuss and see if that's a direction we'd like to go. Uh, otherwise, I think my colleagues have said a lot of great things, and I agree with uh, the direction that we're going on this, and I'd love to see more language. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Thank you, Steve, very much. Right. Yeah, thank you. Have a, have a good evening. Kim, would you mind if I switch you with Andy? Because he's been sitting on a long time, and I know he has a... I appreciate it. You're stuck here, so... So, <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to bounce to... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hate to be realistic with you, but oh, oh well. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to go to boot B, Resolution 23, 1885, authorize the mayor to sign water quality combined financial assistance agreement with the Washington Department of Ecology for the storm water management plan. Welcome, Andy. I know you're sitting there. And Salute. Oh, I'm sorry. Was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a little quick. But oh, sorry. Second. <laughs> Just helping you out there, Andy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Council members. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The audio is getting a little... Uh, Butchie on my end, um, just there. Okay, so um, yeah, my item uh, here uh, for which we're requesting action is a, um, a grant agreement with the Department of Ecology. This would support uh, value-added services uh, for the city's stormwater management action plan. Uh, it, there were funds awarded for a, um, for a competitive grant program uh, last summer. Um, you know, to support uh, the development of the plan. And, um, you know, the, the gist of what the money's intended to be used for are these project uh, management, like delivery tools that will, that they're designed to help us, you know, more efficiently uh, deliver projects and also like stay nimble with this plan. The plan sort of, you know, like a lot of plans expected to change throughout its uh, 20 year time frame. Um, and so the, the tools were, we included uh, in the scope of this agreement will just help us uh, sort of pivot, I think, um, more easily and, um, you know, swap things in and out of the plan uh, as needed. So 
that's um that's the that's the short version i'm happy to elaborate on what the tools do if anyone's interested but um oh yeah the other i guess maybe key piece to mention is that um executing the agreement doesn't wouldn't require there is a required match for the grant but what we're using as match is money we're already spending on the development of this plan those are those costs are eligible to use as match so we're um you know it's um yeah wouldn't wouldn't cost us any city anything new to um to proceed uh with this so i'll perhaps i'll leave it at that ask if anyone has questions any questions yes council member riddle um just a clarification it looks like from our uh, cover letter that the uh cost actually would be reduced by about four thousand dollars is that uh correct that's right yes okay and that's because kind of the the match and the just the the math worked out that way correct that's right yeah that's the that, that's the short version yes we saved a little we save a little bit of money okay uh, and then, um, and and I see some of these tools is is again a GIS based map, and I appreciate um, us leaning forward that way and the, the the governmental transparency of, of these types of things. So I would be uh, in support of of approving this grant. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Casover. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to move um, resolution number twenty three dash eighteen eighty five, a resolution. Uh, authorizing the mayor to sign water quality combined financial assistance agreement number WQC 2023 LAFOED 00102 <laughs> with the Washington Department of Ecology for the Lake Forest Park stormwater management plan. Second. Point of order. Yes. We need to move to suspend the three touch rule. Yeah. I thought this was the third touch. Second. Second. History. Oh, yeah. So I will. Uh, move to suspend the three touch rule for uh, resolution 23-1885. Second. Okay. It's been moved in second to remove the three touch rule from resolution 23-1885. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Hey, Mr. Mayor, on, on point, I think it was easier when I said so moved rather than all the reading that she did. Yes, I know. So, okay, well, it's been moved and seconded. And okay. any other discussion? Yes, Councilmember Hi. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, uh, Director Sylvia, for your uh, presentation. I um, am, of course, in support of this motion. The only thing I wanted to mention is, with all of the different GIS products that are coming out from the city, would it be time to start thinking about finding a single unified platform to put them on? Because I'm thinking that the police might be rolling out something that's really interesting in terms of traffic soon, where I'm thinking about the fact that we, in addition to the stormwater, Public Works has a couple of other ones on there. And now, that, right now, they're on different platforms and it worked fine. But if you wanted to layer them on top of each other and you apply filters to kind of get some information that might be the intersection to very dissimilar data sets, it might be need to have them all on one platform. So just an idle thought. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Councilmember Riddle. Yeah. How close does four thousand dollars get us to a combined GIS map? <laughs> That's all. all right. Okay. Good. <laughs> okay. So everything it's been moved. Any other discussion? Okay. All those in favor of resolution 23-1885, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Pass you massively. Thank you, Council. Andy, that was kind of like Thanksgiving. You cooked for five hours and we all ate it in two minutes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Andy. Good analogy. Thank you. Have a great evening. Take care. Thank, Thank your wife you for sharing it with you. So on to Kim. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Approval of resolution 23-1888 and 23-1889 authorize the mayor to execute the state allocation from the distribution distribution distributors Washington settlement participation forms related to the nationwide opioid litigation. Thank you. It's a mouthful. Council, a year ago, you authorized the mayor to sign for the city the, the one Washington MOU, which um, determined the allocation among the state and the cities for a recent settlement that the attorney general's office was enter entering into with manufacturers, distributors, and um, dispensers of prescription opioids. So we already have that one, MO uh, one Washington MOU signed. This 
um, ask of you tonight, these two resolutions is because an additional five companies have um, settled with uh, the states. And so we are asking tonight that the mayor be authorized to enter the agreements that would um, show participation for each of those five. And again, we get allocation in the same way as the one Washington MOU, but it is an allocation agreement too. So um, that's what we're asking for tonight. Those five companies are Walgreens, CVS, Walmart, Teva, and Allergan. Um, the total for Washington would be $434 million over 15 years. Cities in Washington would get half of that, $217 million. Uh, LFP's percentage is 0.0525. It goes on after that. <laughs> it gives you we get five kiss. bucks. <laughs> but, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the the money can be used uh, or has to be used for, they call it opio opioid abatement strategies. Um, and there is an entire exhibit that lists all the things you can do with the funds. It can be combined with other cities' funds um, and it can be used for treatment, prevention, other things. It's a, very wide, but it does have to be um, opioid abatement. So we're asking you to approve those two resolutions, which give us the um, participation against each of those five um, companies, <laughs> and then also the, the second allocation agreement. Any Thank questions? You. Any questions? Yes. That goes back. Thank you very much. And so um, I'm assuming then that this would allow us to use this money to um, support the Center for Human Services, which is one of the community organizations that we support that provides um, addiction uh, rehabilitation services. So for their budget for that purpose, yes. Yes. And so we will know each and every year how much money we actually get from this settlement. And so we'll be able to just apply that directly to that budget line item then. Yes, I don't think we know the exact number right now because of course they have to calculate the attorney's fees, <laughs> uh, but we will soon. Wow, we just went down to $4. Um, <laughs> Council Member Goldman. Um, related question, I was actually, Council Member Casper kind of stole what I was gonna ask, but uh, my version was going to be about the crisis response center that yeah. has recently opened in Kirkland. Sure. Yeah. Would that also be an acceptable use for these funds? That seems like it would fit very easily within the the exhibit A items that, that are allowed. Yes. Thank you. Okay. I'll move it. We've got a suspender rules. Okay, well, everybody's so um yeah, if I could just uh, clarify with our city attorney here. So we, we need to um, approve this because the signature has to be by April 18th. By April 18th. So we are, there is one um, meeting prior to the deadline, but we are asking for action, for action tonight. For action tonight. It has to be signed by all of the cities as of today. 61 of the 129 local governments have signed so well let's not be tardy i would like to move that we suspend the rules and um authorize the mayor to sign this agreement um i got to find a number here um 231888 231888 um and 231889 these are resolutions, and um, I'd ask for my colleague's support. Second. Second. Point of order. Yes. Do we even need to suspend the third because we this is the third presentation? We did list this as this would be the third presentation. We were going all the way back to last year when you approved the one Washington MOU. Uh, um, so let's move it. All right, then just I'll just move, move the... Um, resolution 23-1888 and 23-1889, authorizing the mayor to execute the state allocation form and distributors Washington settlement participation forms related to the nationwide opioid litigation. Second. second. <laughs> and approved and second for resolution 23-1888 and 23-1889. Do I see any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any nays? Thank you. Passing nicely. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Um, 
Okay, folks, we're going to move on to council discussion. Nothing, any other business? Uh, seeing none, I'm not going to look very long. Um, <laughs> council committee reports. Real quick. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just quickly, we did have a budget and finance meeting. Two items to highlight. Uh, and thank our uh, illustrious police chief, Mr. Harden, for his presentation about the police wellness program and, and all the things that he is and his department are doing to provo pro promote both mental and physical wellness within our police department. We thank you for that, Chief. That's uh, exemplary, exemplary work. The other thing is that uh, our finance director, Vaughn, um, presented us a, uh, we had a discussion about investment policies and the budget and finance um, committee approved uh to invest um on a on a laddered basis in uh a very narrow range of uh, uh federal um uh, notes the uh 10 point what did I write 10.3 million dollars of our reserve monies uh which I believe personally is a very conservative number and we thank my colleagues for all the input this is a very important place for us to be um realizing a return when rates are historically high and they will probably be trending down at a future date, but it's laddered. So liquidity stays very consistent um, throughout uh, the terms of, of what we're talking about, as well as making sure that we have plenty of cash flow going forward. So I think it's a conservative approach and I think it's a very important one for our community. That's all I had. Oh, and the last thing, point of personal privilege, I saw 10 Eagles today right over City Hall. Did you? Did anybody else see them? They were, they were having a party. It was unbelievable. <laughs> um, would you like to add anything, Lindsay, to that? Go ahead. Uh, yes, actually, just to update everybody, uh, we've moved that forward actually as of today, and so as of tomorrow, we will be what they call settling the first round of bonds. So just to give a quick update, so it's moved quite quickly so that's part one of probably two parts of to invest that level of money so the diversifying is happening <laughs> it, it took us three and a half years three and a half years yes thank you there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well done okay did we have any other council committees yeah i have one quick item mr mayor and it's it's one that i do want the city administration to hear um so in the um Solid Waste Advisory Committee meetings uh, of this last month, we talked about the fact that the state is updating its de a debris management plan, and this is for in when there are disasters, explosions, earthquakes, those kind of things, right? The current plan is out outdated. Um, so it's regional, not statewide, I guess. Um, so the plan will be <clears throat> multi-jurisdictional. It's kicking off in April. There will be stakeholder meetings held all throughout the region. There's going to be a meeting um, on April 11th, a virtual kickoff meeting, which it would be great if somebody from the city administration could join that. And it's expected that each city has its own operational plan. And one of the key uh, uh, items in that plan is a site where, where debris can be temporarily stored until it's permanently removed. So if you can just think to some of the pictures that we've seen coming out of Turkey with those earthquakes and the amount of debris that an earthquake creates, mm -hmm. you, this, each city has to have a plan of what, how they clear it off the streets and clear it out of the way and get it someplace before it's then permanently removed to a permanent site, which that has to be organized by the big, um, with the big solid waste departments. So anyway, I just wanted to bring that to your <laughs> attention, Mr. Mayor, and to the city administration's attention, as Lake Forest Park will in fact have to have this plan in place. Actually, the point I'm actually I've witnessed that many times on my mission trips, and when when you go to like a hurricane, basically what happens is everything gets taken out to the street, and people. Just anybody who has a truck gets hired to drive around, pick it up, and that's all piled up in one place, which here would probably be the town center. But <laughs> I actually witnessed this after Hurricane Iniki in Hawaii, too, in the same exact system. Everybody is the same thing. Mm -hmm. You get it out to the road, it goes somewhere, and uh, 
it's pretty phenomenal. So that's a good time not to own a truck because everybody really wants your help. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have forwarded some of the materials yeah, about the meeting, et cetera, to the city administrator and the uh, director of public works. But I just, yeah, I just we need wanted to do just that. to that's get public so everybody knows because Thank it is you. an important thing. That's a big deal. Um, yes, Council Member Bodie. Yes, a few things. First of all, the Planning Commission met, and one of the exciting parts of their meeting was a presentation by the, I think it's called Homestead Community Land Trust, which is has been around for 30 years and basically um, encourages affordable home ownership. And they, they own the land, which is why they're a land trust, but they make... Um, uh, home ownership, whether it's single family uh, cottage housing or now they're moving into some condominium housing, um, they make it affordable. And then um, people can build 1.5% equity per year. So they do get um, equity out of it, but uh, they they the equity is capped because they want to when that person sells they want to make sure it's still affordable so they actually have multiple homeowners and some homeowners who've who've accrued a, like a hundred thousand dollars of equity so they on average people move every seven to ten years out of them so they do get that turnover they currently have i think a little less than 300 units and they're interested in partnering in Lake Forest Park. They have kind of a cottage housing development. I know that word is let, is loaded in Lake Forest Park. Uh, in Tukwila, that's very cute. Um, that uh, could be maybe a pilot project for us at some point in time. So uh, the Planning Commission's excited. The trust is excited. And so there's opportunity there for true affordable housing with home ownership, which is not what a lot of the state legislative proposals are focused on. Um, second, the Parks and Recreation Board met and they have approved their work plan and will be coming to the council to present it. Uh, enough said on that. And last but not least, if you haven't seen it, the Association of Washington Cities has put out an impact map uh, based on that was developed by the Puget Sound Regional Council on SB 5466, the Transit Oriented Development Bill. And it has uh, a lot of pictures of the height. It, it should, first of all, it maps where the heights would be very high. And it's almost all of Seattle shoreline and our whole strip of Puget Sound region. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's really heavy in the Puget Sound region. And if you have critical areas, you can build even taller to get the density thing. So some of the examples they gave were, well, you could build a 20 story building um, if you read it literally. Um, so it's a very interesting and I think helpful a um, uh, uh, presentation by AWC if you haven't seen it. That's it. Mr. Miron, on point, uh, Councilmember Bodie, did you ever get the, I, I was able to see the presentation. I could never, I could get the small map, but I couldn't get the GIS to ever. No, work. I could never get the GIS. It, it just would set, sat yeah. there and never loaded. So, yeah. okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll reach out to AWC and see if we can get an update. Because it would like, be good to be able to see a finer scale. Right. It's the whole Puget Sound region and a map about the yeah. size of a. Yeah. Yes. Okay cards. <laughs> yes, Mayor Tani. Yes, and I'd like to defer to you, Mayor, if you want to give the report on the Blake Ballinger Forum. Go ahead, you're a good speaker. Okay. Yeah, a couple of things. Um, one of them is that uh, the interlocal agreement that uh, we pay into uh, is coming up for um, renewal at some point this year, and uh, there was a presentation made by the staff of various cities to uh, just let the, uh, um, let the, uh, the ILA expire, and so this is something that will come before us at some point. Um, and then the second point was that the uh, WashDOT came out with their report about the culverts under I-5. They're technically under I-5 and under the on-ramps to I-5. It was surprisingly limited in what they were talking about, especially for downstream effects, like, for instance, flooding along uh, McAleer Creek. And so um, there's some uh, uh, comment period that is going on right now, and I don't have the information, but I'll try to get that out to you about where we can put in our two cents worth about what needs to be done in order to make that study a little bit more useful. Thank you. On that, and point on that, the um, reason I'm getting the ILA, we'll get into that, but uh, there's what will happen with that, the Bellinger form will not um, go away, what will open opportunities because Linwood and Snohomish County are real interested in joining. They just don't want to sign the ILA. 
Mm -hmm. So um, in our, we're not with Lake Forest Park, that's great because that means we can bring Lion Creek into the equation. Mm -hmm. And I right. know that my fishing starts way up in Linwood. So you know me, I was all over that. So, but that was a good thing. So thanks, Tracy. And yeah, WASDOT, we're not going to get in a big battle with WASDOT right now because I need to finish battling over this, but they do not really care how much water comes out when they're done with their project mm -hmm. in there. So we're going to have to monitor that. You know, that's but, bad. We need to watch that and see what it's going to do. So, okay, who's next? Anybody? Yes. Oh. Yes. I have a fairly brief uh, comment. Uh, we had the Joint Recommendation Committee meeting today. Uh, again, that's for uh, providing uh, funding affordable housing with with various uh, funding sources. And uh, the big issue or the big item for us is that the ILC and our local agreement uh, for the cities that are part of the Joint recommendation being which we are uh is being renewed uh this summer uh so it's a three-year renewal process so this is that renewal process this is a an opportunity uh for us to renew that part of that is looking at the northeast cities um have a renewal for a arch set aside split um so some money will has been historically set aside for arch specifically funding arch projects and the rest would be uh, just CDBG um, community block development block grants that would be accessible to all the cities. Um, so as a city that isn't part of ARCH, that actually means that we don't have access to a certain percentage of that money. We also aren't building a significant quantity of affordable housing projects in our city. So um, it's just another thing for us to be paying attention to. And there's, there's an upcoming meeting that I cannot attend. So I'm going to uh, be looking to the administration to, to sit in for us on that. Would there uh, be an opportunity with this, how, with this uh, community land trust concept? Absolutely. I think, uh, yes, yes. Okay. I think that is one of the, the uh, types of uh, projects they would fund. That's um, great. So it's competitive. Um, mm -hmm. There's multiple um, funding sources. There's multiple places that uh, actually will fund the same project. Mm -hmm. uh, so it can be very successful. And and for those that are still awake at 10, 10 at night, um, <laughs> housing sure. repairs is a uh, element to their funding. And that would, would help repairs on... A, a single family home that might have a roof leak or need a ramp built for accessibility for someone who's in the low income um, level. So uh, they do some really great work with the funding that they have. Uh, so renewing this uh, interlocal agreement um, is important. And um, talking about this Northeast cities, I believe that they said there was 17 or 19 cities that are in that sub region. Um, and looking at that ARCH CDBG funding split is going to be an important piece. Um, and the, both those are renewed on a three-year um, schedule. So that's just the main thing I wanted to talk about. And um, they're tracking a bunch of bills uh, related to affordable housing. Um, so I can share that with the group as to how they're tracking those bills and which ones they're seeing as successful. But they are uh, looking at some uh, bills that would, would provide additional funding at the city level. Uh, so they're tracking those bills, uh, just specifically for affordable housing. Um, so they're tracking those bills, and a few of them seem actually to be having some success in the um, legislature. So Great. that's it. Anybody else? Um, real quick on the land trust, like one of the gentlemen I interviewed for the Planning Commission uh, works for that for King County and has quite a bit of knowledge about that. And actually, Maddie and him talked about it. That's a lot great. Here. So, um, yeah, we that was great. Um, no, everything's great. I am going to make a statement, though, about my coffee on Saturday. It was uh, it was well attended. Some new people, as usual, people have just moved to the city. I will report that it was tried to be hijacked by a citizen for their own thing, and um, I was really disappointed. In fact, some of the people came up to me and said they were disappointed on the with the person that tried to do that. Um, I hope that doesn't happen again. And I'm saying this to the public: the mayor's coffee is not to battle with people. It's just to let people sit around and enjoy the fact that we can communicate civilly and talk about stuff. But um, uh, the chief was there. It was a little hard. It was, uh, but you know, that's the emotions come out in people. But sometimes you got to realize that these get togethers are mainly just to build city camaraderie and try to break it down. So um, with that though, uh, 
You guys have a great week. I've been up for 16 and a half hours. I'm going home. I don't care what you have to say, Tom. I'm out of here. Hey, this is important. <laughs> okay. Po point of order. <laughs> if anybody tells the mayor of me the outcome of the Gonzaga game, we're removing you all from our Christmas list. Is that correct? <laughs> oh, that's true. That's <laughs> true. See, I, I, you, I'm so tired. I forgot that. that I DVR'd it. I probably went mom went to bed and heard it in the radio tomorrow morning. I would say we have administrative support, but I don't think Lindsay wants to pull that off tonight, right? Okay. Yeah. What? Bill's a Saturday? Oh. oh. Well, we'll celebrate his birthday next week. Or birthday. Two weeks. <laughs> I'm going to put a horse in his office like they did on Animal House. Yeah, that is. And Lindsay has one. Oh, that's awesome. And it fit too. <laughs> Let's get out of here and have a good week. Thanks, everyone. Thank oh. you.